Thank you very much for coming. I'm, I'm happy that you're not tired of looking at my face already. I'm going to be talking about applied evolutionary epistemology, which I, I hope will soon become a new discipline of uh, uh, philosophy of science and philosophy of biology. And so applied evolutionary epistemology comes from evolutionary epistemology as it was defined by Donald Campbell. And Donald Campbell was one of the first who in the 1950s, uh, in 1959, he wrote his first article, was interested in the evolution of cognition. And so um, he realized very soon and before uh, um, uh, the field of ethology uh, was defined by people like uh, Nicholas Timberg, and he realized that if you want to talk about behavior and if you want to talk about the evolution of cognition, and if you want to talk about that in Darwinian terms, natural selection theory is a theory that explains evolution to occur at the level of the organism. So um, it, it talk, and the Neo-Darwinians, they would talk about uh, how natural selection is possible to occur at the level of populations and so on. But they would not think about behavior, they would think about anatomical form. In a very real sense, natural selection theory, as introduced by Darwin, is a theory of anatomical form. And so he realized that if he wanted to implement natural selection theory to study behavior and cognition, he had to, um, what he called, make a skeleton or a heuristic of natural selection. And he said, uh, if we want to think about how we can apply natural selection to behavior and to cognition, we have to think about what is universal and how we can universalize natural selection. And he said, that what is basic to natural selection is a, a heuristic which he dubbed blind variation and selective retention. He said as soon as you have something that varies blindly and that is selectively retained, you can say that that's something evolved by means of natural selection. And as such, you can study the evolution of cognition, which is a behavior by means of natural selection. And so what he did uh, by introducing that um, heuristic is he freed natural selection from the domain of the gene. And uh, before people were introducing the units and levels of selection debate, he was asking himself how he can universalize this formula. Now, evolutionary epistemology um, is a, a philosophical discipline that started to, um, um, with the idea to study knowledge as the outcome of evolutionary processes. And before Donald Campbell introduced these ideas, there was Conrad Lorenz, and so there's a very strong co connection between evolutionary epistemology and the field of ethology. Eventually, in uh, 1959 as well, the same year that uh, Campbell first introduced his paper, there was the Darwin Centennial as well in 1959 in uh, Chicago, which was organized by Sol Tax, who was an anthropologist. He's also the... Um, the founder of the Journal of Current Anthropology. And um, Soltax uh, uh, eventually uh, made the proceedings that he edited uh, from that conference, which was published in 1960s, um, in, in 1960, which was called um, Beyond, uh, Evolution Beyond Darwin. Now, um, it is said that at that conference, uh, Huxley was um, um, pleading for what he called universal evolution. So people at that conference, they were uh, investigating uh, how at, at that time there was a distinction between the uh, anorganic, the organic, and the superorganic, and the superorganic was related to culture. And people were thinking about how you can universe, how you can evolutionize the study of the superorganic. And uh, Huxley was one of the first to say that it is evolution all the way through. Um, so this is, this is one way of looking at the introduction of the study of cultural evolution. But I'm going to give you four stories on how we can study cultural evolution. So this was one. The second one that sort of came as a reaction to Huxley and, and, and to evolutionary epistemology was um, uh, the theories of gene cultural coevolution as they were introduced by uh, Wilson and uh, Cavalli Sforza and, and eventually Boyd and Richardson in 1985. And what is typical here is that people are still thinking in these three domains. You have the inorganic, the organic, and the superorganic. And so um, people like Boyd and Richardson and people like Ter Terence Deacon uh, today, they still assume that culture is this um, uh, structure that is on top of biology and that evolves by other means. And so what they were doing when they were introducing these ideas of gene cultural coevolution, 
is they were thinking in terms of um, horizontal transfer. They, they, they didn't have the mathematics to think about it, but they thought about that. They thought about directed natural selection. Um, they thought about how to think about cultural evolution as not being blind. So this is a second way to think about um, evolution. And then there is a third way, which is associated with the units and levels of selection debate. Um, the units and levels of selection debate grew from two papers. One paper introduced by Lewontin in 1970, which was called Units of Selection. And uh, here, and this is also independent from Donald Campbell, Lewontin, he said, if we want to talk about units of selection, we have to think about what the logical skeleton of natural selection is. The idea is that you have to make a universal skeleton that takes it away from the level of the gene in order for you to be able to think about how there could be other units out there that also evolve by means of natural selection. And eventually, in 1982, Robert Brandon, he said that besides uh, the units of selection uh, debate, you should also think about where that unit evolves. So in 1976, Darwin had, uh, Dawkins had uh, published his The Selfish Gene. He said that there were cultural units such as the memes. He said that there were um, that the only true unit of, of of natural selection is the replicator, any entity in the universe of which copies are made. And so um, people started to think about um, what these possible units of of selection could be. You had uh, David Hull, who introduced the notion of an interactor, interactor, which is basically a phenotype that interacts with the environment. And, and uh, so people were thinking about what could be possible uh, units of selection and what could be possible levels of selection. Um, this differs from classic Darwinian thinking and from the modern synthesis even because according to Darwin, what evolves is the organism and it evolves at the level of the environment by means of natural selection. Uh, what Dawkins did is he said that what evolves is the gene uh, and it can evolve at the level of the environment by means of natural selection or you can have whole gene complexes that can evolve by means of natural selection at the level of the environment. And out of that group, the idea that a gene can also evolve at, mu at multiple levels, that the level that the environment as such is not a homogeneous structure, that it is a heterogeneous structure um, that you can divide into several niches. And so, for example, you can say that the gene evolves at the level of the genome or at the level of the population or at the level of uh, a species. Um, and things like that. And from that grew the idea of the units and levels of selection debate. Now, from all those three um, uh, um, ways of thinking about cultural evolution, the only one that really made it was the units and levels of selection debate, and it was in, as it was introduced by these philosophers and by people uh, such as Dawkins. In 1983, Dawkins published an article which he called Universal Darwinism, and in that he said, that if something is to evolve, it has to evolve by means of natural selection. This, this idea uh, grew, grew very strongly, and as such, you had uh, eventually you had the introduction of what we call the new evolutionary sciences. You have uh, evolutionary linguistics, as defined by Pinker and Bloom in, this, in their 1990 paper in uh, Behavioral and Brain uh, Sciences. You had the evolution of um, evolutionary anthropology and the introduction of uh, evolutionary psychology, as it was introduced again by Cosmites and Tubi. And so what was typical there is that all of them were thinking about how to implement natural selection theory into the study of the sociocultural domain. Um, and eventually there was an accumulation in 1995 where all these ideas sort of started to grow together. Very close to his death, Donald Campbell eventually said that his theory of evolutionary epistemology was basically a form of selection theory. In 1995, you also had Daniel Dennett uh, publishing his Darwin Dangerous Idea, wherein he claimed that all and only natural selection approaches are valid. And he uh, was very strong in that. He said that natural selection can explain the how, the why, and the what for of, of uh, evolution. And also in 1995, you had a book uh, written by maybe the last <laughs> evolutionary epistemologist, which was Gary Zico. And Gary Zico, he wrote a book called Without Miracles, Universal Selectionism. And he said that natural selection is the only theory that can explain uh, any kind of evolution and that all other theories are would-be challenges to um, natural selection. Now let's focus on a fourth story of how to talk about evolution. 
And this has to do with what are these would-be challenges to, to natural selection. From uh, the 19th century onwards, people have been studying um, symbiosis, symbiogenesis. From the 70s onwards, people have been studying punctuated equilibria theory. From um, the 1980s, from the, the late 1970s, people have been studying um, uh, systems theoretical points of view, developmental system approaches. You have uh, eventually, it started with Gould, who, who wrote his Ontogeny and Phylogeny in 1977, and then eventually um, you had people uh, such as Oyama and Yablonka and Lamp, who are talking about Lamarckian inheritance and how that can uh, somehow model cultural evolution. And this is stronger than co-evolution because people here are, and this is also what we've been discussing uh, this morning, people are not only thinking in terms of metaphors here, there is the idea that there is something like cultural evolution, that it is uh, mechanical, that we can find mechanisms, that we can find causal mechanisms that explain these types of cultural evolution. Now, today people are pleading for an extension of the modern synthesis, and it has to do with the introduction of lateral gene transfer, symbiosis, developmental systems theories, etc. I have very high hopes for these theories. But what is lacking and what is necessary and what I want to define as a pied evolutionary epistemology is we have to do for these theories what has been done for natural selection. The only reason that we can today say that culture evolves by means of natural selection is because people have been developing these logical skeletons, these universal heuristics, such as blind variation and, natural, uh, and, and um, selective retention. And people have been debating what a unit might be of natural selection. Is it a replicator? Is it a meme? Is it an interactor, etc.? Now we have to basically do the same for every evolutionary mechanism that we know that is out there. So what are the units of symbiosis? What are the units of lateral gene transfer? What is the logical skeleton of niche construction? These are questions that we have to raise. And this, of course, means that there is an enormous amount of work that needs to be done. Now, why do we need such a universal language? We need such a universal language in order for us to understand each other, to have disciplinary bound, bound uh, to, to be able to cross disciplinary boundaries, and for us to be able to, um, in a very objective manner, talk about how uh, cultural evolution can proceed. And now we know that there are processes sh such as lateral transfer. Um, again, when, when uh, Cavalli Sforza was making his trees on populations and languages and humans, and, and, and he was applying that from within a selectionist approach, he immediately said that he realized that language evolution and that cultural evolution can uh, occur horizontally, that there can be crosses, that there is directional evolution. Today we have people, for example, uh, such as Tal Dagen, that have uh, quantified language borrowing by using network approaches that were introduced to, to model um, horizontal transfer at the prokaryotic level. And that same methodology provides a language to study language borrowing. So there is hope that we can do this. Uh, people such, such as Quinton Atkinson uh, and Mark Pagel have been uh, quantifying um, uh, language uh, phylogenies and they have also found there that you have the pattern of punctuated equilibrium, long periods of stasis which are intermitted by short periods of rapid change. Now, um, we, we have to find a universal skeleton of all known evolutionary mechanisms that, is out there, or that are out there. We have to debate what the units are of these evolutionary mechanisms, what the mechanisms are of these evolutionary mechanisms. And as such, um, we can develop a new philosophy of biology um, and, and, and um, a stronger foundation of cultural evolutionary theory. Thank you. Thank you.